On today's podcast of Data for All, the data education crisis. Welcome to the Data for All podcast. I'm Charlie Yielding. And I'm Charlie Apigian, where we want to empower you to think different with data. And on today's podcast, we, we're beginning to discuss the current state of education and the crises they currently face. Yeah, and um, we're going to use my data mindset approach, which by the way, I have a couple of updates on that, um, where we go through the dilemma stage, mm -hmm. then data discovery, and that's mm -hmm. I really looking at the data, um, looking at insights, and then doing some storytelling in the end to lead to actionable solutions. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm excited and scared for this topic because it's my space. Yeah, it definitely is your space. But before we get into it and get a little deeper into the, the, the dilemma part of it, let's talk about you, Charlie Apigian. Me. And what, and what you're going to get up to this summer. Yeah, and uh, so this summer uh, is the first time I'm not an administrator mm -hmm. uh, at all. And so... I get to do whatever the heck I want, Charlie. And um, and what I'm doing uh, to start the summer is working with our host uh, here, which is the Nashville Technology mm -hmm. Council. And we've uh, they we've talked a lot about what I've done in the basically I, I'd almost say it's like data strategy, taking data to action model, and that's the data mindset that I talk about, yeah. and how especially like middle management really needs that. Um, you have a, you have a lot of people in technology, um, that know technology. You have a lot of mm -hmm. business people that are now in technology and they, they're missing those little things. And it's, it's the simple stuff of, um, people will start with the solution and then go find the data. Right. And, and we want to, and I think we'll, we'll do that in, in, in this case, the, uh, the education crisis, uh, that we're facing, uh, do the same thing. And so we've put together a five week program. Mm -hmm. Um, we're meeting three total times, uh, and the other two weeks we will we'll be virtual and it's meant to be for those aspiring leaders. Um, could be entry level. It, it, it could all the way to be to a C level, but to individuals that want to get the better skills that they will need to, you know, truly turn data into action. Yeah. So, so you're stepping out of the, uh, the world of academia this summer and getting straight into the workforce reeducation or reskilling, if you will, or upskilling, I guess is, would be a good way to, to, to put this one. Yeah. So you're, you're going to teach, you're going to teach professionals how to use data to create that action, uh, that you're talking about through yeah. your model. And I did this model. last summer at Alliance Bernstein, mm -hmm. um, and really enjoyed it. And what they said is, you know, we could send people to go learn Python. Yeah. We, we have more than enough dashboards, mm -hmm. but none of those are leading to action. Right, right, right. Can you help us there? And and a lot of people say, well, you can't teach that. You got to experience it. And I agree. But can I accelerate the process? Can I yes. fast track you to better data enlightenment? And and I believe you can. I So I think that it, it is something that you can teach, though, because mm -hmm. there's a um, – in my own experience, there's been – um like when I see when I see other business leaders, middle management and stuff out there and they're they're trying to run the operations of their business, they have like they have an idea of what they should be doing. They, mm -hmm. they know that they have metrics that they need to be keeping up with and and like they know they have the data that could tell them something. It's just that they don't know how yeah. to get started yep. or or where to go get it. And that's what you're teaching them. And so you you're not just teaching them that, you're teaching them a vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And that's very important too, especially if these are the folks who are talking to the data analysts, the data scientists and everything, they can better communicate with that data portion of their company because as we're all, you know, learning, there's going to be a data and AI portion to basically every company. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and there's so many things to unpack of what you just said. Uh, that is, it is literally the pain points that you hear more and more mm -hmm. is nobody knows. There's so much data. They don't know where to get started. Yeah. They don't know what they should do. Is this AI? Is it business intelligence? Is is it data science? Is it just a bar chart? Yeah. Um, you know, what do I need to make a decision? Darn it. And what normally is now happening is people are inundated so much with the data noise that's yeah. out there mm -hmm. that it's, it is paralyzing. And, and so you don't move forward. And so 
that I'm, I'm noticing people just want that clarity that yeah. I want to make real decisions. How do I do that? Yeah. And, um, and we'll see. We'll see. Procedurally. Yeah. And this will technically be my third time teaching this in an executive environment, mm -hmm. except now it's open up to more than just one company. And um, since the last time you've taught it, you've met regularly with CDO group and with CIOs. To, and, to and, hear their perspectives. And they're the ones that wanted this. Mm -hmm. And and it's not really for them. They're, they're like, hey, the people underneath me. Right. So that's why I say, if you're an aspiring leader, uh, we would love to have you. And, and what I hope we do more than anything else is create more of a data community. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's like a, the elite program, which uh, is part of the NTC here. Yeah, where we train up new emerging leaders. And but but you but they stay together afterwards. They have yep. mentors and they're part of this alumni and they get together and and they they feel this bond. I love that. Yeah. And and I, I want so I believe everything when I do education now, and we'll get to the topic of education here in a second, yeah, is for sure. Um, is you expose people to things, mm -hmm. you get them to experience it, which creates comprehension. But at the end of the day, for it to be sticky, you have to be part of community. I don't disagree with that. And we've said many, or I've told you many times before, you are glue when it comes to community building. So I'm excited to see what you grow out of the yeah. C group. But there's some other self-promotion that you need to do. What? No, that was it. Mm -hmm. What, what else am I doing? The, the individual coaching. Oh, so yeah. So as having those conversations with C-level folks, I was uh, asked, well, would you be willing to do one-on-one -on -one coaching and be the data coach, right? Uh, so I'm not Mr. Executive Coach because that's different. Um, but if you feel you need uh, to get that data acumen, and it's different. Like if you're a leader and you're, you have use cases today where you need help, yeah. going through a class is great. But what, having that person to bounce it off of mm -hmm. is really helpful. And right. so you, you're doing a terrible job of selling yourself. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna sell. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So this summer, Charlie Apigian is accepting executives for his data executive program, where he will take you, the individual, through multiple weeks of yeah. walking through your current or your existing problems helping you understand how data can help you get through those problems and then also teach you how to draw action from the data in the same kind of data mindset. It's the same thing he's teaching out here, but it's one-on-one -on -one with you and he will get you through to the other side, so to speak. And so after you've gone through these executive or these executive level data classes or coachings yep. or whatever you want to call it, you'll have a data mentor uh, built in for you know forever because that's just how Charlie works. That's but in how the I work. Time he's going to get you to the point to where you understand the current level of data AI and all of those types of uh, new net new business interactions. So there you go. That's what he's doing. He won't say it like that, but that's what he's doing. Cut and print the commercial. Thank you, Charlie Yielding. You, I, 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 I can't do it yet. I'm not ready to be Mr. Self Promotion, but it's so good to have friends that are willing to do it for me. Yeah. Well, I see what you do for, uh, the people you currently work for and you promote them relentlessly. But then when it comes to yourself, you're just like, I don't know. I don't know if yeah. I should brag about myself because it, you know, it feels, it feels like bragging and that's not natural yeah, to you. It's not. It, and I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll get into my daddy issues at some point in life. Um, and it's not daddy issues, but um, I will say this. Um, so to give you more specifics, I believe that should be a four month engagement. Four months. And in the first month is really about exploring, you know, getting you to a certain level. Mm -hmm. The next two are going to really be about how do you do that within your organization or in your personal life mm -hmm. or in your community, because I cannot do anything without making sure that you impact more than just yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and then that fourth month is me doing everything possible so that you don't need me anymore. Uh -huh. And, and, and then, like you said, just like last night, I literally uh, went out with one of my former students. Why? Cause he called mm -hmm. and he needed, he's trying to get a job now and wanted help. We went and walked down at 12 South and spent about a couple hours together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yes, it, it, and, and so that never goes away. There. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, you can walk around with a beer in Nashville, yeah, since an open pandemic. container. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't I know that advantage. until yesterday. Oh, I took advantage of that when, oh. when I like my favorite thing to do was to go down to this place called Southern Southern Grist. Yeah, get a six pack with a buddy and then just walk through the neighborhood. Wow, it was a, I, it was awesome. I, I 
didn't know that was a thing. So he goes, hey, let's just go walk around. I'm like, we can't do that. And we did. Um, and uh, which I cannot drink a beer and walk at the same time. I learned that yesterday. I just, I just would you just walk. like, I, it wasn't my thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I was afraid of spilling my nice IPA, I right, guess. But, fair enough. Uh, but yes, I am doing that. There will be more information uh, about that stuff as I get going. Um, and you know why, why I want to do that? Because I want to do that. Mm. I do. I, I love this idea. I used to think I wanted to impact everybody at once. And then I realized what I get the most gratitude is working one-on-one with folks. Well, I, it, you still get the same results though, because mm-hmm. it's, it, that's one of the things where I feel like you've, you've kind of like your perception of the situation is that you have to touch everybody, like you just said. And as a, as a leader in business and stuff like that, your, your actual direct influence is much smaller. Yeah. And then that influence carries to the, to, you know, down the chain, so to speak, mm-hmm. if you're looking from the top down. And so you're about to go, uh, work with executives and that's going to change their culture. And so you'll touch way more people than you would trying that's to a good work point. with everybody. Yeah. Oh, I like, I like the way you frame that. And for some reason, when I talk to people at higher levels, when I talk, they think I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so I'll take that as a good omen. I actually was in... That was, that was self-deprecation. Yeah, like usual. Um, I was actually in oh, the room just down the hall from here with uh, the CIO council mm-hmm. uh, here and did a lot of this. Just to, And I bounced it. And it was it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and, and everybody, when you start talking, um, you say, what's the biggest problem? They don't go to technical. Mm-hmm. You know, so you got to fix... The the culture mm-hmm. and the people first before you start adding on technical stuff. That's, and and that's I think that's that's the main mission this summer. And so for for everybody listening, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask why that's important, and then you try to think about the answer, and then we'll talk about. And then and so pause it right now. Why is it important to change the culture around AI and technology with regards to business? Pause. And now, do I have an answer? Now, yes, now that, now that uh, of back, course. What? Yeah, yeah. There's so many things that um, you notice, and it's not one answer. Um, mm-hmm. There's so many. Uh, actually, we when we were talking about this in the CIO Council, I put s- about ten different things up that said, "Why do data projects fail?" Mm-hmm. And in in most people. Um, they basically go to the wrong spot in the beginning mm-hmm. um, and and then never have the ability to go back. It's always a people problem. It's always technology does not fix things between you and I. Right. They don't they don't lead to things. And as long as businesses cater to humans, mm-hmm. humans will do the action at this point. Right. Um, now, are we going to use AI to do it? I was, I was at a coffee this morning. It's like, when is business is going to embrace AI and we're not going to eat us anymore. And I'm like, when AIs are doing business with AIs, yes. But if I'm, the human component's still going to be there at least for now, right? And I believe it's actually for a long time. So anyways, all of that to be said, can I, can I um, uh, completely deflect again? Um, no. <laughs> no, absolutely not. So I want to I want to dig a little bit deeper on just that specific situation, the the people part of what you're talking about. Yeah. So people have egos. Yes. Right. So if people have egos, then it, and it and it varies by degree based off of the individual. Executives typically have a larger ego. Yes. And as you as you go up in a company, and this is from my own personal experience, people stop telling you you're wrong as much. But what data does is it's a great equalizer. And so somebody's saying something on the top and then a data scientist somewhere in the middle says, hey, that's actually wrong. This is the right thing. That ego is going to get in the way. And it's and it's happening every single day. Like I talk to so many people that work in data right now that are saying leadership just doesn't trust us. Yep. Leadership won't listen to that's us. That's right. And then there's other companies that are a little bit further down the road that's, that said that leadership didn't listen to us and it cost them $6 million in yep. one quarter. And therefore, it's a people problem. So the reason they didn't trust them is the process. It's exactly. not the, you know, it's it's not the data at that point. And, and so if you, um, and, and, people at the highest level mm-hmm. need to accept that people underneath them are scared. They're, yeah. y- if you give them a directive and say, go do this, they go do that. And then they come back to you and you're like, that's not what I wanted. It's because you didn't know what you wanted in the first place. So, so say that, right. Mm-hmm. But they're not. Yeah. So then it's, 
it's the person, it's the data person's job to be inquisitive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually love this uh, uh, methodology that uh, I've used as kind of the basis for the dilemma stage. It's called quantitative intuition. It's out of Columbia University. And they are fixated on asking the right question. And that is so important. If we ask the right question in the beginning, it changes everything. And if you can not only ask the right question, understand your audience and their pain point, and then make everybody part of the journey all the way through, then when you get to the end, they're not going to say they have trust issues mm -hmm. because they're part of the process. Okay. Well, so you just set up a perfect segue. To? To, to you. No, to the education crisis. Yes. So what is the question right now? What is the what is the question that they should be asking more than anything else? I think it's always a data problem. Mm -hmm. And we are still basing our education system when we could not assess and use data, right? Mm -hmm. And so everything not is at scale. Not at scale. Yep. And so everything has has this delivery method. Mm -hmm. You learn, memorize, and then give it back to me and see if I can understand it. Mm -hmm when you are surrounded by all of that data in the real world, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the education system is not a good reflection anymore of real life. Okay. And you're talking about primary, secondary? All of them. Okay. You know, and, and so we don't have the answers yet, but as things continue to change, we're trying to figure out, people are saying, are people going to be dumber in the future because they have AI? And, or are they going to be smarter because maybe they don't recall it individually in their heads? These are my students, by the way, saying this. They're asking if people are going to get dumber? Yeah. My, my students, so I've got this amazing class. The, oh, the, geez, yeah, yeah. the last episode, you got to meet them all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, They're a good bunch. Oh my gosh. They're the best. And we had an AI conversation and, and one student in particular, Cameron, uh, he, he just said, I'm afraid that everybody's just going to get lazy. And dumber. And I'm like, I understand that. But what if at the age of 18, you have enough knowledge at your fingertips that a PhD used to have to, ha mm -hmm. you used to have to get a PhD to have, yeah, yeah. right? So that's where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so that is, that is empowering. And now we have delivery mechanisms out there where, why do I need bad teachers? Because they're local. You know, think about all of the different aspects of education. Mm -hmm. It is about content. Mm -hmm. It is about experiences. And it's about creating that environment of continuous learning. That's why I believe community is so important yeah. as part of education now. Um, and as you look at that, how do you create knowledge and experiences, you know, and, and if we're spending K through 12 only with knowledge mm -hmm. and then 18 to 22 – uh, you know, your, your normal, uh, higher ed years mm -hmm. dabbling a little bit in experience, but mostly still knowledge. Mm -hmm. We're, we're, we're now throwing them off the cliff and saying, go get a job. Yeah. It, and it's I, just not working. It's a, it's a problem for sure. Yeah. And I think it like, it goes way back to the, the moment that somebody said that to, to be something other than a factory worker, you need a college degree. Because somewhere between where my parents grew up or That's when my true. parents grew up That's and true. when I grew up, it yeah. became a requirement for anything. Yeah. And so my degree is in psychology, which is basically nothing. It didn't, it, it did help me get my first job though. And I think I've mentioned this before because arbitrarily one of the requirements is that I have a degree in, you know, a college degree. Yeah. We got rid of that quickly because the type of work we did, it was, it was only making it harder for us to find good candidates. And that's the point yeah. to the point you were just making. Like, why would I hire, uh, a crappy professor when they're local, when I could find the best professor, but they're in a different state. Yeah. And so, so that's, that's all like potential, um, resolutions and whatnot. But today we're framing the conversation in your data mindset. Yeah. yeah so. And so, yeah, let's, let, let's focus on what you need to know in the beginnings of any real problem. And this is a problem, right? Mm -hmm. And, and by the way, we're going to give opinions today that maybe in the, in two episodes, we're going to completely reverse, right? Yeah, yeah. Because we're trying to come up with the real problem. And so a real problem to me is normally not measurable, right? 
Like, okay. like literally education is not measurable. I mean, we use proxy testing. We use proxies to measure it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, we, we use other factors. It's kind of like our health. Same thing. Mm-hmm. We, we want to be healthy. So we look at weight. We look at uh, A, A1C levels if you're di- diabetic. Oh, yeah, yeah. We look at other proxies. So let's assume the goal is not measurable. So then we're using, we're going to look at well, other factors. So let's talk, like, just, to, just to be a little bit more detailed. So the goal is to become educated and an expert in whatever field you're being educated in. Is yes. that the goal? Yes. And we need to define what is education then, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and so if that's the case, then we have to identify the audience that we're trying to help. Are we, are we talking about the youngins or are we talking everybody? Are we well, talking adults? And that, that becomes really important in this conversation. It does. I think in, the, in primary education, though, it, it's, a, it's compulsory. So it, it's a little bit different than you've got a captive audience. Mm-hmm. And, but secondary education, there seems to be there seems to be an additional problem with forcing students to do something that's not in their best interest because it's in the best interest of the school. And that is so, true. And so that's, um, I think there, I think there's a, it's okay to say we have two different caveats or two different categories. And, and then the third category is, uh, like, uh, adult education, reskilling, mm-hmm. all of that type of stuff, like boot camps and whatnot, because they've even had some, you know, the, the pandemic, like we're getting into the problems and stuff in a minute, but the sure. pandemic impacted every layer of education. Mm-hmm. But then it, it, like I said, with secondary education, it impacted a little bit and it, it, it there's additional criteria. Yeah. And let, let, let's stick at the generic. So let's assume traditional education mm-hmm. is, um, the primary audience. Um, and I say audience because it can be community based. It could be individually based. Um, and what, what we have to think about is the overall objective. What is it that when we say we're educated, we are. And so let me, I'm going to, I'm going to use a scenario. Um, let's, you got the psychology degree. Mm -hmm. Did you become a psychologist? Negative. All right. But what did it do for you? It allowed me to apply for jobs. It allowed you to apply for jobs. And you did get some problem solving. You worked around. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it was the acceleration of your education. So education is more than technical skills or skills. So I always like to make the differentiation between education mm-hmm. and skills. So okay. for me, to become uh, a decision maker mm-hmm. is is part of the, my educational process. Okay. But every time I wanted to go learn Python programming or if I wanted to, what have I learned lately? Um, I've, 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 I learned how to use, uh, what, what, what's a, oh, geez, how did I forget it? It's not Adobe Premiere. It's the, oh, Final Cut Pro. Mm-hmm. All right. That's a skill, yeah. right? That's different. I don't need to go and get a four-year degree to learn Final Cut Pro, but I might learn it because I'm in, I'm getting my education around how okay. to do all of these other yeah. things. So when I think education, I'm thinking problem solving, uh, learning on my own, all of these other skills. And so to me, that's what's important. So uh, let me, uh, let me try to wrap my head around the way you're saying it. So, so education is the ability to look at grass root or grass level stuff or get in the weeds basically all the way up to the high end decision making because you understand the entire stack of the yep. subject matter. Yeah. Whereas a skill is something you add at individual layers. Like maybe at this layer, you need to be able to program and yep. then this layer, you need to be able to integrate and yep. this layer you need whatever. And so those skills, I see, I see what you're saying now because skills can be taught independently, but they don't, equate to an education, which education is the ability to, to move in the entire space. Exactly. And, um, in a four year degree, Mm -hmm. the best part of it is getting an education is, is accelerating going from 18 to 22. You go from not fearing being in front of people to, I can work in an environment, you you know, all of the, it's almost like the soft skills. You're, You're working on more of the soft skills than the hard skills, but we also, in the past, the content was not available to us mm-hmm. except in school. Right, right, right. And that's one of the dilemmas we're about to talk that's about. That's the dilemma is we are so content heavy because that is what we had to be 20 years ago. Now we're at a point where all of that knowledge is not only available to us, but it's better externally a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Like, 
it's, if it adapts more rapidly for sure. If I'm I'm, I'm going to teach Python uh, programming in the fall mm. for uh, freshmen and sophomores. Mm. I'm kind of excited. Um, and as part of that, um, what do I teach them? First of all, but there's books, right? Mm. They're horrible. Nothing against them, okay. but let me let me change it. They're not unique to what I want the students to learn. Sure. I don't want to teach intro to Python. Isn't that why some teachers write their own textbooks? Uh, sure, sure. And I, it's why I never use a textbook um, because I want to teach Python for data science, yep. Python for data. Well, you what book educate. is out there? So, so there's this mismatch. And so a lot of times students are getting – the old version mm -hmm. um, instead of uh, what they can, but they're also getting the ability to work in a team environment. They're, they're learning how, what happens when it breaks and, and how to fix it, you know? So they're learning the educational components, but they're sometimes getting antiquated knowledge. Yeah. No, so that. you're breaking my brain with the, with this education versus skill stuff, because like, I'm thinking like, was I educated? Like with a, with a degree in psychology, like I did learn some stuff. Were you more employable at the end of four years of or five years of education? Uh, not because of the specific content of my degree, but rather that I had the degree. Okay, and that's it. I, I got a feeling because so I'll use my twenty-five-year-old son right now, mm -hmm. um, who is a civil engineer doing very well. Mm -hmm. At eighteen, I wouldn't have given him a pencil to draw anything. You know, um, in other words, I, I didn't feel he was ready. Yeah, but he's going in. He's a professional. He, he went to a professional school that they're teaching him how to do a specific job. Yes, but his problem-solving skills, mm. because your your job as a civil engineer, yes, it's to draw lines. No, that's that's a designer. That that's or that's you know low level. His job is you've got to put a road in and make sure it doesn't flood, mm -hmm. and that cars can get through on that and not be bogged down. That's problem solving. Yeah, that by twenty two he was a lot closer mm. to being able to do that. At twenty five, he's really good at it. Nice. You know, and so that education, that part, he needed the three years in his job, mm -hmm. but he couldn't have started that at 18. Yeah. There's too much, re too much requisite knowledge to, to, to just jump into it. Like not to say you couldn't do an apprenticeship in the same way, yeah. but the, the point of a, of a college or a school or university or whatever is standardized education. So you can say, Hey, you've gone through this program. So I know, you know, at least X, Y, and Z, whereas apprenticeships are great, but they're very individual. Yep. And so one can be awesome and one can be awful Yeah, and they can exist at the same time. So, um, I've never thought of it. Uh, so I, I believe pro programming skills are a skill. Um, I believe most of the things in technology, if I can learn it online, mm -hmm. a lot of times I think of it as a skill. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I am a 100% uh, taught, self-taught programmer. Mm -hmm. And I've been teaching programming now for 15 years, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you can do it. I know you can. Yeah. Um, what about math? Is math a skill or an education? Well, so that's one of the things that I was also thinking about going to my high school days. So I used to say, I'm not good at math. Until about five or six years. No, no, no. I forget. I'm 44. Until about 15 years ago. <laughs> Jeez. A little bit different than four or five years ago. It's a, it's a, bit, a bit different. When I started to understand, when I started to like get into my own, like, uh, like I started getting interested in uh, physics, uh -huh. you know, space yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. And then so I started to learn that math is, is just a language. Mm -hmm. It's its own language to describe how materials are, you know, like how, you can use it to describe how materials exist in, in reality yeah, and how they move through reality and all that type of stuff. But then you can also get into like how they could theoretically be moving through some other dimension and stuff like that. Yeah. But you, and they, they oftentimes get to a point to where they say, I can't express this in words. I can only express this in math. Yeah. And so then I, that got me thinking like, well, if it's, if it's like its own language, then what did I learn in high school? All I learned in high school were skills. Yep. My math teacher did not educate me on math. And I feel like that's a big failing with math just in general. That's a great point. And I, cause I believe math is logic and math is then an educational component. If you get to that level. Yeah. Like, um, so my son took five calculus classes. Mm -hmm. He would have taken a sixth one if they offered, he loved it. You know, and, and so, but is that really that skill building, mm -hmm. but it's also 
that's what created the problem solving between 18 and 22, that accelerate. So without having that calculus mm -hmm. and the other math courses, he could never have started at in, in his professional job. Yeah. So a little bit of skill. So it's, it's, there's, they're not mutually exclusive. Like every I, time, I, yeah, yeah. every time you take a class, you're learning educational components, I hope, mm -hmm. and you're learning skill. Yeah. It's just sometimes you're getting more of one than another. Um, and, and now you have to identify if skills are available to you. Mm -hmm. I can, I can now use AI to write code, mm -hmm. but why am I writing the code? What is it for? How is it going to be operationalized? Mm -hmm. What was the question in the beginning to get me to write code mm -hmm. and try to solve a problem, right? Mm -hmm. All of that is still an educational process that, that a human, I think, still needs. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with that. But now I'm getting more and more pissed, though, because I wish somebody would have educated me on math to begin with because it is good. It's it's, it's fun. It's fun, like, looking – like, uh, you know, you, you're talking about your son. Like, your son can look at a bridge – you know, yeah, and uh, he can see the math. He can see the math in the bridge. Isn't that beautiful? So when when the bridge got hit last week in Baltimore, somebody could look at that and see like, oh, I can see where the math yeah. made this thing fall apart. But and it, and it's a hundred percent based on there's a uh, um, you know between uh, one foundational component and another there is a beam that beam has a certain uh, weight bearing and it's like he'll talk to me about that stuff like the gradients going up a ramp mm -hmm. and how it has to be a certain amount and you know and I was I was thinking about this it's like in his field when I was a kid every road flooded yeah and now they don't why. Because we have engineers that, well, that create roads instead of just people like me. My uncle was actually the same type of engineer, and he used to tell me that he, he built ditches. That's what he said. Yeah. And then it come to find out he's designing the entire roadway and just the ditches are how like that without ditches concern. you have flooded roads yeah, yeah. and, and that's why there's all of a sudden why is there a big pond over there well because without that you couldn't have that uh, ramp there uh, because of all of that yeah so that that to me is so that uh, math is a great example mm -hmm. and so now when we get into the world of data and 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 AI the problem is we think it's only a skill it's only a technical thing. Mm -hmm. And we forget that it's a logic. It's, it's yeah. you know, the only reason we have data is because we're trying to capture reality. Mm -hmm. And we use that reality to help us make better decisions in the future. Mm -hmm. We've lost that. And that's well, I don't the, know that we ever had that. Well, I'm trying to create it, right? And that's yeah. the, if you want to not learn, there's programs and one-on-one -on -one coaching that you can get. Look at me. Exactly. I, I just did there some self-promotion, uh, which I can't wait to do self-promotion for you, by the way. We are going to get to that. You're not doing self-promotion for me. Well, I do self-promotion for me. Well, yeah, you, you, you're, you can do that yourself. But what I mean by that is I can't wait to get to updates about you here. The next and, time and, I'll be ready. All right. That, that's good to hear because, uh, Charlie has some things cooking. Charlie, why that is oh, yeah. that I'm I'm very excited about for you. I think well, yeah. we're we're very complimentary in the approach that we're taking towards towards uh, what the future is going to look like. I I'm excited. Yeah, you know, and uh, well, uh, I don't want to go sidebars, mm -hmm. but we'll 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 just keep going. But yeah. I'm I'm interested if uh, our Charlie's in charge episode uh, got you anybody. Uh, uh, did anybody make comments to you about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a, uh, it was a, it was coupled with like uh, uh, me, you know, me exiting and everything, and so yeah. like I made like a low key type of announcement about it, and a bunch of people reached out, and it was uh, to a message. It was extreme positivity, yeah, and like good. It, it, it was something that I didn't. Uh, it's not that I didn't expect it. I was I expected well wishes and stuff like that, but just the people, the people's general and genuine excitement about what I'm doing next. Yeah. Uh, well, that's good. And and I I had a lot of people come to me and just say that they were they would have never guessed that I went through anything because mm. I was always well you're chipper charlie chipper charlie and been always way you know nice and and i'll be honest you know to our audience cuz we're close and personal i came in here today and i was like god i'm just not in that mood and then mm -hmm. we hit record and it goes away um because we did a little we get bit of focus. buttering up beforehand yeah we did we did so let's get back to buttering up yeah. this idea of education what are some of the things that you feel in the last 10 years let's say um have impacted education 
Um, well, so it, with secondary education, I want to go back to the 90s because the 90s is, you know, like I graduated in 98 and uh, the ex- expectation, at least then, and I don't know how it was for you, you know, a few years mm-hmm. earlier, but the expectation was that if you want to do anything aside, besides work in uh, manufacturing, which is just a factory job, which I did, uh, and it was not for me, then you had to go to college. Yep. It's actually my, my path was uh, went to community college for a semester, took two years off. Um, had to start paying bills, so got a factory job for about three months. Decided that was absolutely not for me because I mm. wasn't going to get run down and like discarded because manufacturing in Mississippi is terrible. Uh, and then and then went straight to school. Yeah, got student loans because they they would just give them to me. Yep. Uh, and then paid my way through college while working part time at Radio Shack on the weekends, and I made good money, but I was also bad with it. And so, even if I didn't need the loans, I still got the loans because I just wanted to be able to be comfortable yeah. or whatnot. And they, like I said, they would give them to me. A lot of people gave me money when I was 18 that should not have. Yeah. So, I paid those bad boys off, but that was also at the in the earlier days of the price increases where you could pretty much count on 10% year over year. Yep. year. Um, then the highest inflation rate we have had has been college tuition. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've I've looked at some of the numbers. Like I feel bad for students these days that that have because it got worse after I went to college. It went from uh, like I started in two thousand and nine at G squared, and that's the, mm-hmm. the requirement was a degree, and we didn't get rid of that for two more years. So in two thousand and eleven. We had a requirement for a college degree for just a entry walk. level as well. Entry, it was entry level is all get out. Wow. And so that was that, but that's just the, thank that you for the, doing that because that kept people coming to academia. Well, that was the mindset. Yeah. The mindset was like for me to, you know, like, and this is, I even paired it this early on. I was like, you know, a degree may not be important. It may not be it, like what you're dealing with, but it shows that you can commit, it shows that you can get something done. And th- you care about the intangibles and the only data that you had mm-hmm. about a human um, is, do you have a degree or not? A piece of paper. Yep. Yeah. If you have a piece of paper, at least you finish something. Mm-hmm. That is literally why people go into debt sometimes. Yeah. I mean, that's why I went into debt. I yeah. went into debt because I thought that's what I had to do. Yep. And then there's a lot of other people who went into debt because it's all, they think that's what they have to do. And in some cases, they absolutely did. So that's one That's one aspect of it. The second aspect is technology and access to information. So in primary education, uh, the pandemic really put everybody on their heels because kids went home. Kids still have this hybrid work you know, a hybrid situation where they've got laptops that they have to do homework on and they have to take it home. Yeah. And do they have internet at home matters now. Yes. And that used to not matter. So access to internet or to the internet has become much, much more important than it was before because that's literally how some people are getting educated. So that, so you introduce that technology and that remote aspect to it. Well, then you go to colleges and this is just my outside perspective they don't want people going home they want people to come to their fancy brick and mortar stuff that they've been spending the last 15 years building up and you know like they they want people there well certain ones do certain ones do that's true yeah i mean i definitely i mean a private university that gives a top-notch educational um opportunity for Mm -hmm. people experience uh but you got to be on campus to do that Mm -hmm. uh you got to be on campus to do that, right? And I will say, Belmont is an amazing, amazing place to be on campus. Mm-hmm. My son is finishing his first year. He loves it. Mm-hmm. Loves it. He's learning. Um, he's in a great program in nursing. Um, and that's great. But that doesn't have to be every kid. And by the way, that is a lot of money. A lot of money that I would not have spent if I wasn't working there. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? You mean, you said your son. You mean your daughter. I've got two kids going there. For nursing? No, no. My son is a, is a freshman in nursing. My oh. daughter is finishing her doctorate degree in occupational therapy. Have I ever told you how freaking proud I am of my kids? Yeah, but I keep on, they're hard. <laughs> you don't know how many kids I have still to this day. How many do I have? You got four. I got four. Three boys and one girl. Yes. And I've got, you've two. got a mechatronic, you've got an engineer, you've got a, I, I didn't know the youngest one was a nursing student. Yeah, yeah, and then you've got yeah. the occupation. And then, then occupational therapy. And uh, yeah, and then, you know, my, my middle son, who's going to my former school, mm-hmm. who I don't get any tuition break That's because of me. That's the mechatronics kid. Yeah. Got a full ride there mm-hmm. and is going to spend the summer in Germany um, 
uh, doing a research internship uh, with nanotechnology for semiconductor manufacturing. Oh, he's going to be that so the dude that's is going to do. A, yeah, that's the, big. So now that we've got a big old chip act, like Intel's got billions of dollars from the government to get chip stuff going here. I don't think Intel should get that, but in, by any means whatsoever. Hey. Like AM. Anyways, I digress. It's sure. a, it, it's a it's a very good place for him to be. But 100%. he's also he's also in one of those jobs that's uh, that it, he's going towards a professional degree, which I think universities yeah. absolutely should do, should be doing professional degrees. And if you're a university that requires those folks to come to campus, that's great. But that's also something that's not necessarily you know it's it's a part of the dilemma. It's mm-hmm. not necessary anymore. Yeah. So let me. I'm even going to take a step back from that for okay. a second. Um, you live one life, right? Mm-hmm. So I hear. Um, you get done at 18 uh, for the high school. And if you went right into a job, that means at the age of 18, you are now on your own mm-hmm. learning skills. Hopefully, you're going to be around people. Um, but it, it's a tough go at the age of 18 in this country. It just you, is. You mean out on your own and whatnot? Out on your own, mm-hmm. right? If you have the opportunity to go to a university or go to an environment where you're around people your age, mm-hmm. you're having fun, mm-hmm. and um, you're ex- I believe you're accelerating the education process in those four years. So I, I think everybody gets educated mm-hmm. throughout their life. I believe between 18 and 22. Right now, I don't know another way that accelerates it better mm-hmm. than a university. Um, except there's probably some jobs where you get to do a bunch of different things. But most of the time, if you get a job of 18, you're not – you're not getting the skills, all the, all of the skills that you yeah. need to be a well-rounded person. Mm-hmm. A university tries to give you that. You look, you get take writing, you take communication. You, you've got to, if it's a liberal arts style, I love that. I love the ability to take another science class and all that. So the problem is if doing that puts you behind for the rest of your life mm-hmm. because of debt, I don't know if that's the right approach, but if you have the means to do that, Mm -hmm. I would 100% encourage any family, any individual to go do it. You know why? It's the best four years of your life if you do it right. Yeah. I, I, I don't. I don't disagree with the with the fact that a lot of people have really good experiences in college. They mature a lot more. They get they get their hands into some like uh, some messy situations yeah. from an interpersonal perspective. Uh, I think that they can learn a lot in in school, but there's a lot of I mean in in the workforce, but there's a lot of freedom that comes with fellow students. Like you can be friends and classmates, whereas. Uh, in the workforce, yeah. like if you go crazy a little bit too much in that in that time frame, you lose your job. I, I've had many a friends that have had to. I was usually the person taking people home, uh, Mister. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if that was a colleague, I'd be like the next morning going. Hmm, if I saw some of my uh, fraternity brothers do certain things, I don't know if I would want to work with them the next day. Well, that's the that's the <laughs> it's the give and take of the of of learning those things. Like not every lesson's an easy one, and yeah. so getting that out of the way, which you know is. It's a. It's also a reason I'm glad I didn't have a cell phone that took pictures and videos and stuff like that when I was that age, because I was dumb. Oh, uh, we 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 all and and you I know what though? Things. But don't you smile every time you think about that? Mm-hmm. And it was oh, it was yeah. it was good. Time, now, yeah. um, if instead you do an online degree and you're you're taking courses and you're you're having to do that on your own, that's a different experience. It's yeah. also you're not getting the educational experience that I would want you to have. If, if you, you know, cause I do believe that as long, mm-hmm. I do believe that being around people doesn't have to be every day, doesn't have to be every class, mm-hmm. but being around people rounds out that educational process because what I care about is normally the ability to work with others. Yeah. So let me, let me ask you a question then, uh, in the workforce, when we went mm-hmm. home, uh, we went it, like we had the, the we'll call it the water cooler moments. Yep. Uh, where two people are having a conversation and you arrive at some point of inspiration because two people connected ideas to create a new idea. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't have to be anything major. It could just be like I was dealing with this problem. It's like you were dealing with this problem. This is how I deal with that. And they're like, oh, holy crap, that's awesome. I'm gonna start doing that. And then they're like, oh, that's great. And it's, it's a sharing of ideas. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're that's what you're kind of getting at. So we went home. And all of that kind of happenstance stuff went away because it brainstorming became, went away. 
Well, it, it became a proactive effort. Like you couldn't mm-hmm. randomly brainstorm because you had to physically connect to another person, which yeah. means you have to call them. And if there's one thing that we don't like nowadays, it's calling people. And I'm even in that boat. And if you I, call me, I'm not answering. I'm not, I might like you, like if <laughs> except you're if call, you're my mom or dad. Yeah, yeah. Certain people get a pass, but if you're going to call me, you just be like, "Hey, I'm gonna call you in a minute." And I'll yeah. Be like, All right. Yeah. I will, then I'll feel good about it. I always answer my phone to be sure. But it's sometimes it's just to berate the person. It's just like, why are you calling me? This could be a text message. Yeah, yeah. Little, well, a, I may be exaggerating a little bit. I think that. we need to go back to phone calls. It's kind of like our, our our little Marco Polo thing. Well, maybe you know? yeah. So maybe maybe there is a situation where we we underemphasize phone calls because we didn't need it and we were doing all this thing interpersonally. But now, uh, so like one of the things that one of my former co workers came up came up with is a, the concept of a shared space on the internet. So we've got a call basically open all the time and people can just drop in and out of it as yeah. they want. And then they're, uh, they're setting it up. They, they actually pitched this and are setting it up after I'm gone. And so I'm curious to see how it went. But um, it's uh, there's specific topics that they have, you know, different days. And then they have like little games that they're putting in uh, mm-hmm. that they can play back and forth and stuff. And so it's, it's creating that community in the hopes – that the same type of water cooler in, in things will happen, you know, in that environment. Cause it's not just chat. It's, it's, you know, you can jump yeah. in on your voice. And so it's a group of people talking. It's a little bit different with your cameras off and stuff because it, it gets hard to not jump over people and whatnot. Yeah. But it, it, it feels like the, in the same way that education has a crisis with that, I think we're all dealing with that same type of how do I create what used to be in this new thing? Yeah. And, you know, um, there's so much to that. And then, of course, in the academic, uh, well, the pandemic, uh, during that. The academic we, pandemic? The academic pandemic. It was a pan, it was. Um, and of course, K through 12 struggled, because mm-hmm. um, they were not ready for that. They were not. Um, I feel bad for all of the teachers and administrators. Uh, you know, in most, uh, most public universities mm-hmm. have a pretty large online component. Yeah, I'm thinking about high schools. And- yeah, no, I'm just I'm going to uh, the four year education stuff. Yeah, I was surprised, but now I'm not surprised that most private schools had n- almost no online presence, oh, yeah. unless it was intentional. Um, but you know, the point of a a lot of times a private uh, university is to get an on campus experience. So they they. They were encouraging you to be on campus, yeah, and well, I, and I saw some of that, and not not the not on the Belmont side, but I saw some of that with other universities here, where their encouragement was like, "Look, teacher, I know you're sick, but just put a mask on and come teach this class." Ooh, yeah, um, and and so I, um, in in thinking about that, now we've now created bad education, and and it's it's. Well, let me let me change that. Yeah, yeah. Education is about more than delivery of uh, skill based information, yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we all of a sudden lost that part. Like, so I think our kids that missed that year, whatever whatever they were with that uh-huh. COVID year, missed out on some of the education stuff. Maybe not the skills. Maybe they got more skills. I think it was the opposite. Do you think so? You think they stopped listening to the uh, skills part or didn't have the ability to learn it? With my kids, so with my kids, uh, they didn't have the ability to teach the younger kids the skills that they needed because there's so much like I'm standing, I'm working. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the comprehension experience part Mm -hmm. was was missing, you know, but um, we we know of like the Nashville Software School here in town. Mm -hmm. Uh, They went completely remote and haven't come back. Yeah. But they teach skills. They, they take a lot of, a lot of times they take educated people mm-hmm. and help them pivot into a new career. Yeah. And, and that's a great, great thing to do. Well, what do you need? You need skills. And you need skills, but you also, like in their case, you need community too. And they they do a good job of creating community as well. I um, have heard people say that pre-pandemic community was better than post-pandemic community. Well, yeah, but they were also full-time in person, yeah. Um, of course, that's better. Which is, which is the dilemma. Yeah, it's like you, you, you spent like because in their, in their, in the NSS, in an, in the NSS's case specifically, they got rid of space to help with overhead so they could educate these folks during the pandemic. And now to to come back into person, they'd have to reinvest 
like a significant amount of capital uh, to be able to to come back in person mm-hmm. just to rebuild the experience they had before. So they let go of something that's hard to pick back up. That's true. That is true. And and once you make that commitment, it's so much easier to focus in on doing good there. Yeah. Right. And it, and so. But I think universities or some universities have the opposite. Like they didn't do enough remote. And then the, that requirement to come back has, like, it doesn't feel like it's either or. It feels like a blend mm-hmm. is, like, maybe the way to go. Like, maybe you're, well, you, you, we'll, we'll get into that later. But so, so as far as, like, the, uh, to get back to what you're saying, so they are capable of teaching skills at in secondary education to remote students, but the overall education is suffering if you're just 100% sure. remote? Sure, sure. I mean... You know, um, working in a team environment's different. Like it's it's good that they're learning those skills, but we are not creating that same environment that is a normal remote working uh, working environment yet. Now, some universities might be doing a better job than I know of, but you know, if you're in a company and you're fully remote, you're utilizing Slack, you have all of these other things. That's hard to do in a 15 week class and then start it over and over Mm -hmm. and creating those bonds and stuff like that, or having the Every week stand up, you know, you have class, but you, and then you're having class where, you know, how engaged are you like for real Mm -hmm. when you're sitting at home and somebody's just talking on the screen versus if I'm in the classroom. Yeah. And we'll get into this when we start talking about the data, but there's, there are some people that thrive in that. They work their best, their, their best lives are at home alone all day long. And I love them for that. But the majority of us are not good. That's right. We're not going to be proactive enough. We're not going to be like, we need to be managed. Mm-hmm. As a, and as a remember, you're talking about work and we're still talking and it's education. Well, no, no, no. There, in, the, even in the education world, most people need to be managed. And that's like, did you do your homework? Did you do this other stuff? Like, I'm checking on you and I'm going to be watching you because I know you need that help. Do, do you need to be managed or do you need uh, a way to focus? I mean, as somebody that is... Is that not the same thing? Uh, well, I don't need somebody to manage my focus. I need to focus. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is me at home uh, with my three dogs is not a, an, an optimal place to focus. But if I go somewhere, and that's why we, we were talking about co-working space earlier yeah. today, uh, I need that right now. And and it's not going... Because because I'm doing stuff that's not my university, mm-hmm. uh, I don't feel comfortable going there to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. So, but doing it at home, I lose focus. Yeah. So it can be environment. It can be self-discipline. It can be an individual or, or, or it could be a manager over, over you as well. But so, um, so people do need to be managed or they need the environment to focus. Well, what I mean by managed is it also in the education realm is, is like, the giving of the giving of work to make sure that you're keeping up with everything that you need to to make sure that when you take that test you get as good a grade as possible on that test. And go ahead. Nobody, if people will say all the time, "Well, I'll just go on the internet and learn." Mm-hmm. Okay, learn what? One thing about education, if done right, mm-hmm. is it takes you through a path. Mm-hmm that gives you the skills you need today for something you're going to learn tomorrow. Because it's standardized. That's right. Mm-hmm. And and so we're teaching you statistics today so that you can take that analytics course in the future. Mm-hmm. We and un- you know that that is really powerful. One of the problems that I ran into when I was trying to learn on my own and what a lot of us do is we go to what's cool mm-hmm. and we don't have all of the background in it. And yeah. so we have a lot of holes in what we're learning. And so there's a lot of data science people that learned a task. I mean, uh, there's a ton of people in AI right now that are learning by whatever the cool new thing is and don't realize there is math behind that. There is a methodology. There's a reason you use certain techniques mm-hmm. over others, but they've never had the chance to learn that. So like somebody uh, was with me yesterday and they're like, well, you're going to use a neural network for that. And I'm like, no, I'm going to use logistic regression. Mm-hmm. It's it's not big enough to be a neural network. And so I went into everything. And it's like, I thought you used that, a neural network for everything. And I'm like, no, there's, there are times, yes, you do, but there's times you don't. And so how did I learn that? It was through experience mm-hmm. and good mentorship or or. or you know, a, a, a faculty member back in my PhD days. Or education. And, and it was education. Yeah. So when I say mentorship, I was talking about a professor yeah. in that case. So let me, uh, like one of the, 
one of the analogies I used to use with uh, coworkers, because when, when somebody started, we put them through 16 weeks of training to make sure that they, that yeah. they knew we educated them on how to be a mobile expert. And the reason, the, what, the reason, not the reason, the way I put it is like, just think about yourself like a, a piece of Swiss cheese. Yep. You've got gaps in your knowledge that you don't know about and whatnot, but when you put all the, p- the pieces of cheese together, you've got a solid block mm-hmm. and you know you know maybe a piece down here has a different hole than down here but yeah. in, in the end you get the full coverage because you've got the ability to uh to network your idea mm-hmm. and so is the important thing the networking of ideas or is the important thing being in person when you're networking ideas I think it's the networking of ideas. That's a great way of, of, of thinking of it. And, and, you know, I always call that the aha moments, the uh-huh. Swiss cheese yeah, yeah, yeah. moments. So, you know, like a lot of people in the Excel world mm-hmm. um, know 30% of Excel, honestly, <laughs> right? And yeah, that's if you're really good, yeah. right? So every time I would teach them, oh, I know how to do that. And then you're like, you can do that. And, and, uh, you know, what's power pivot or whatever the, the newest thing is that you can do with it. And so um, there's a lot of that out there, but, I think that is the, that is education Mm -hmm. is the ability to connect all of these different things you've learned Mm -hmm. and problem solve or do this other stuff that takes time that Mm -hmm. takes, but it it really just takes a hyper focus, which is years to to get there Mm -hmm. of understanding what your real goal is. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm going to bring it back to dilemma, so there's usually when I, when I think of dilemma stage of any data project, and we're using that methodology here, Mm -hmm. the dilemma to me is understanding my audience. It is understanding the real goal that we're trying to achieve Mm -hmm. because I haven't, I can't measure it yet because I don't know what data I have Mm -hmm. um, at the ideation stage. I also always care about the, um, the pain point for people. So my audience, what's their pain point? And then you get into limiters or opportunities. So, so, so we just have limiters, lack of resources, lack of people that can, you know, teach or whatever it is, there is a limitation well, okay. limiters to, to our education process. So I like the, uh, I like the, the example of the, the, the good professor. So a limiter of like pre pandemic college was like access to, to, uh, professors that are willing to move to your city. Mm-hmm. And last time I checked half the universities, if not more are in boring cities. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, half. Yeah. It's a well, lot more I mean, than that. So it, it, the first time I, I, uh, came across that concept was actually when I was up in BDSU and they called the, the Bowling Green State University yeah. in Bowling Green, Ohio, my alma mater, my undergraduate graduate degree, go Falcons. Yeah. Heck yeah. With that, <laughs> that awesome brown and orange. Brown and orange. Ah, I hated that. So the, uh, the folks there refer to the, to the locals as townies. Sure. And so that, that's because there ain't much to it. And so if you've got a, if you've got a brilliant professor and you're trying to bring her across the country to this place that has townies, but she wants a bit of the city life. Yeah. Then what are you gonna What are you gonna do? You're just not gonna get her, and then you're gonna have to go for your second choice. Mm-hmm. Whereas the pandemic and this, you know, this new way of thinking could open up different choices. Yeah. And and so I, I just don't want to make it seem like it's it's all bad. There's definitely silver linings to to the the current dilemma that education is facing. Yeah. But it takes a mindset change to be able to achieve that stuff. Yeah. And, you know, today's not about solutions, yeah. um, but my mind always wants to go there. Um, and and as you and as you said that, you know, there's a lot of uh, I'll use a, a, a low, you know, even just Tennessee Tech. It's in Cookville, Tennessee. Without that university there, there's no Cookville. You know, mm-hmm. um, or it's not the same, you know, Knoxville, uh, for University of Tennessee, can, uh, uh, in Knoxville, that, that university is what is the life of that town. Um, yeah. Middle Tennessee State University is the largest employer in Murfreesboro, you yeah, know. Yeah, Starkville's the same way for Mississippi. State. Oh, it's gosh, yeah. Um, and, um, and so you have a lot of that and, and that, that, that's good, bad, and different, but, there's a lot to that mm-hmm. in the fact of you want local people. The whole point of a university, at a, a public university, is to educate 
your community so they can be brought up. Mm-hmm. That's that's a public university approach. That's their mission statement, right? Right. I mean, literally, Middle Tennessee State University, my, my where I, I used to work, their job is to educate Middle Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, that's not Nashville. It's, it's the surrounding areas mm-hmm. of Nashville. Um, and I think Middle Tennessee did a great job of that. You know, it wasn't maybe the same experience you'd get at a private university that could offer 50 different events every night, Mm -hmm. but for a quarter of the price or actually even less than that, Mm -hmm. you got a pretty good education for a job in your region. Yeah. I think uh, most of the natives I know either went to MTSU or they went to WKU. Yeah. And so, but Western Kentucky University yep. is the same kind of situation. Absolutely. Like it's, meant, it's meant to educate Western Kentucky. That's right. And if we go north from here, that's basically Western Kentucky. That's why there's directional schools, right? It's like literally they're talking about the location mm-hmm. that they're, uh, and it's, and it is, um, managed by the state government, public universities. So there will not be another university that comes down to Murfreesboro that's public mm-hmm. because why would you why would you do that and steal from you know your mm-hmm. current store right because that's like having a store the thing that's interesting though is they're still all independent mm-hmm. and they're competitors mm. of that's, course they're competitors awesome you know so we get we're now at this point where knowledge can be disseminated more standardized or in standardized ways, but you get way more options as well. Way more options. And there is, I know, one, at least one good person in every state that can teach a topic, right? Mm-hmm. All right. I want to learn from them. I don't want to learn from the person at, at, at whichever other school. When I want to learn from the best. say you want the best education, you want it. I want delivery of knowledge mm-hmm. from the best person that does that. And I think I can get that through an online environment. But I will take somebody local mm-hmm. to help reinforce that to help manage it, to be a facilitator. See where I'm going now? And so now I'm, I didn't want to go to solution, but yeah. what I'm trying to get to is, can we think different about our education space, knowing that knowledge can be delivered differently, but experiences sometimes still have to be in person, you know? And, and we have our cake and eat it too. Yeah. Yeah. And this idea of a master class with reinforcement locally is 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 has been rattling in my mind for a while. So I know we're not supposed to go solution today, but but it allows here's why you talk solution though. You don't you don't start with solution, but thinking of possible solutions helps you frame your dilemma. Yeah, yeah. And and so um you know, what's the real pain point? The pain mm-hmm. point is um but what is the real pain point? Well, it's better to ask you. You've got kids coming up through the system right now. If you were to say, what is your main like what really riles you about the educational process for your kids as they move up. Which level? Um, th- all the way through undergrad degree. Let's not, well, we want to talk graduate stuff today. So it's just the secondary edge. Uh, well, the high school stuff. High is school like, through That's college. a department education thing. That's a government and politics type thing. Not sure. that government and politics don't play a role in universities, but universities are more business-like and independent in their transactions mm-hmm. and whatnot. So my... My thing, like my biggest concern right now is that I feel like schools are working against their students' best interests financially. Uh, and, and I think that they're like, look, guys, uh, we've got this stuff and we need you to come to it. Like we, you know, mean yeah. we got this campus and we need you to come to it, even though it's going to cost you more money. And it might keep you from getting the best education like you were just referencing. Yeah. Because what am I going to do? Am I going to, and this, this happened a lot during the pandemic in the business world. Am I going to come to school to do remote calls? Yeah. Like, is that what you want me to do? Come sit in the classroom and do a remote thing with a teacher just so we can be in the same classroom? That teacher is who facilitates the community in the group or yeah. in the room. Now, not to, having that, having said that, we'll get into more of the solutions. Like, do you have a local facilitator, but then the education is coming from this premier mind or whatever? And that actually, um, so before I left MTSU, I proposed a data science curriculum for K through 12. Mm-hmm. And that was the proposal. The proposal was to create facilitators Mm -hmm. with a master content uh, that I would create Mm -hmm. for high school teachers to be able to teach data science. And Um, and and the state bought it, and we got $2.6 million, and then I left. mm. Um, And and so – and and 
boy, I wish I would have done that. I, I, I really wish I would have had the opportunity to create that master class mm-hmm. that could have then allowed the track coach to teach data science, right? Because I would be teaching them mm-hmm. asynchronous. And then their job is to make sure that the students are doing the exercises, that they're that when they do have a question, they have the ability to get an answer. They don't have to know it. That's where we, we keep failing is we are still wanting teachers that know everything. Mm-hmm. And as it's a professor, like developers. Yeah. And I'm good not knowing everything as a professor these days. You shouldn't. You should have an area of expertise. I mean, like, you know, in elementary school and stuff like that, it's like you can know everything because you don't have to go deep. That's right. But then at some point, you've got to go so deep that it, you know, maybe two disciplines is working, but three is too much. Yeah. And, and from a high school uh, student perspective, like, I think we typically do a good job of breaking out the specific skill sets, but we're also, you know, like, my biggest concern when it comes to my kids' education in high school is that they're unseen. Like we've mm. got the teachers working so hard that they can't, they can't, like they might as well not be in person because they're not getting that education. That's a good point. And so Cly- uh, my, my son's uh, fourth grade year was, it was, that was his year after the pandemic and he just had a burnt out teacher. I felt so bad for her because she worked so hard for two years and every single time she turned around, she was just getting another slap. Hmm. And what I mean by that is it's like, hey, here's this other thing that you need to do. Hey, here's this other thing that you need to do. So she had all the ESL kids. She had all of the, uh, like she had a classroom full of children that were just in her classroom all day long. Hmm. All the other teachers got a break. Like they got to switch subjects. They got to switch classrooms and all this other kind of stuff. And then for her, all day, every day was just the same, let's run her down to a nub type situation and then she is like at the last you know the last semester we'll call it she was just checked out yeah and and so you just brought up one of the biggest problems in the k-12 through space burnout not burnout burnout happens because of and um so the goal of a teacher is to educate their kids Mm -hmm. we don't have a good way of uh measuring that so we came up with a standardized way, oh. you know where I'm going now, oh, I do know. Um, uh, to measure it. Mm-hmm. And that standardized way missed the mark. I'm sorry. It misses it the did. mark. It does. I don't think there's any standardized test that will be able to measure right now what the real goal is, which is an education. Do you know what the deal is right now with TCAP and third graders? Yes, and it's a huge, huge problem. But go ahead, and uh, people outside of our state are going to be shocked. So if uh, – so TCAP is the standardized testing for the state of Tennessee. That's right. Last – you know, so the pandemic happened, and to address slippage, what they said – or what they be in the, de- the Department of Education, the board, whatever, whatever mm-hmm. it is, they said that since, uh, since we can't measure how good the students are doing, we're going to up it. And so ELA is English Language Arts. It's just, it's just what you call English now. Yep. So in English, the kids have to get a better than average score to not take summer school. Better than average means that uh, that's they're less passing. than fifty percent, though, right? They're pa- that's technically what a distribution of that is. Yes, they're passing. They it, it, they're better than how, how does that happen? You know, but go ahead. So they're it's equivalent to making a C on a test and then being counted as failed. Yeah. Counting as, as it's failed. And so one of the big things that the, the teachers, and I, again, I feel so bad for them and the administrators had to deal with last year is the state's like, Hey, this is happening. Yeah. And you've got to tell all your students. And so what a lot of school districts did is they said, Hey, administrators tell your student population. And then the te- the administrators were like, Hey, teachers tell your people. Yeah. And I talked to uh, a, a a teacher from a rural school, and she said that they were forbade from bringing it up until it happened. Wow. And a lot of kids went to summer school. Uh, most kids. Most, most third graders. So um, that is, so there's a reason why third grade. Um, and we may have mentioned this before, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to reiterate it. Um, so at the end of third grade is pretty much the end of your education where you don't have to know how to read. Mm. So in f- so you learn to read up to third grade, yep. and then you read to learn starting in fourth grade. Mm-hmm. Um, so that idea we hear it all the time. It's actually a, a they're doing this because of a data thing. You, if you can't read in third grade, you are more likely not to 
graduate. And that's like the number one indicator of future success is third grade reading. Um, and, and it makes sense now if you think of it that way. So they're harping on it. So they have now taken that one data point mm -hmm. and changed everything. Changed the entire policy for an entire state off of one data point. One data point. And it's not even a good data point. It's, it's one of many that lead well, to success. Well, it's not right? a good standalone. But, well, so yeah. the, the criteria that they're measuring is you have to be above average just to be normal now. Yeah. And, and, and that, yeah. So, uh, that is, that's a great example of it's missing the goal. And, and too often in education, we try, well, it is our job to get everybody educated. We want everybody to get a high school degree. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you have to have standards, but it's so hard to figure out standards. Even for, I mean, administrators that have been doing it forever, you are, you are taking every possible, uh, uh, person and, and, and life and every situation and trying to get them, them to a certain level yeah. is really hard. Um, and, and I believe if, if you think about this, if you could standardize the knowledge part, even, you know, if you could stay home two days now, we want people to go to school because it's great daycare, right? A lot of times. Um, <laughs> I mean, and, you're not lying. Well, I mean, it literally is daycare, um, yeah. for us. And, but if you could learn online two days a week and then facilitate two days a week, I still think that would be a better education than five days a week in a school. I mean, the truth is, especially your last year, you waste most of the time that you're in school. You're going between classes. You get to class. You got to set up. And then you're there for uh, 50 minutes. How much of that is real learning in those 50 minutes? Well, per class, right? Yeah, I remember in high school, 50 minutes lasting a lot longer <laughs> than it actually does. And so it seemed like a long, long time for me. But then I've also tried to teach things things in fifty minutes. It's just, impossible. Yeah. It's, it, we can't even do a fifty minute podcast on like anything. That's right. Um, and because you start. You have to ramp down, and that means you only have about 35 minutes to actually learn something. Mm -hmm. And then Mikey in the background is acting up, and you get completely off track, and all of a sudden you're down to 20 minutes of actual learning time. And so you can see how it's not the conducive environment that we want. Now, yeah. again, I don't, we, today is about talking about the dilemma. So we are negative because we're trying to identify a problem, but, um, but these, these are things that we, anecdotally see and now we want to go back it up with data in in the future yeah. episode so so a, a part of the a part of the next one or my takeaways from this one are, are how can we have our cake which is remote learning mm -hmm. and eat it too which is uh in-person community um you know checkups yeah. whatnot it's the same reason we're talking about working together in a shared space it's because we would work like just being together in yes. the same space even though we're working on separate things is conducive to to a better product in the end because i'm like hey what do you think about this and, oh and it's two minds are just better than one that's just how it works always always i mean most of the time two minds are better. well i'm always better talking out an idea yeah. Um, and so, uh, for some reason, Squish these days is not responding to me talking about data. And she, that's my I mean, English she, bulldog. To be honest, she doesn't look like she would come up with a lot of bright ideas. But, Squish is smart. But, Frank, on the other hand, come on now. Uh, I think that's more of a, a, like a judging a book by its cover. Uh, I mean, you got to let me finish. Then this, the second piece is with uh, with primary education. Like I feel like the you know the the politics behind the the TCAP scores and stuff like that aside. How do we grow our teacher base in a quality way that in, that induces the type of education that you're talking about rather than the skill sets? Because like I want my I want my kids to have a math teacher in high school that explains that educates them on math rather than teaches them how to do uh you know like a how to set up a parabola or like what sine, right. cosine and tangent are. I want them to say like, hey, all of these graphs that when stuff that we're dealing with is math for physical space. Yeah, you see that you see that curve out there. That's that's there is a number that's associated with that curve, and yeah. in that curve, there's a pressure point, and all this other type of stuff. Like I, I feel like that's more just opening them up to the concepts that like math isn't just sets of equations that you stack up until one day you're like, I know math. Yeah, it, I think um, 
you grow the teacher base by shrinking it. I don't disagree with that. And that'll be a part of the interesting thing that we're going to be talking about next time is like, how many quality teachers do we need that teach data science? Yeah, or or do you only have to say that? You know, it's it's as simple as math, right? And so if you were to say how many how many people are teaching math because they're a coach at the school and, and they need a job versus that people that absolutely science. have more physical science. Yeah, yeah not I, the college physical science. Well, I, I will say my no, he was a history teacher. Uh, some of the best teachers I had were my coaches, by the way, um, or coaches, I should say. So I'm not, I should not say that coaches are bad uh, teachers. My coaches, they're the coaches that taught me in high school were bad teachers. Well, I can go back to Mr. Chrissy at uh, Plymouth Canton High School, who was a baseball coach and was the best, best history teacher I ever had. Um, he would tell stories that he was a storyteller, really, really good. Uh, and he would come behind you because I was one of his uh, – students and he would grab your shoulders and just give you a little bit like you know he would engage you and i was like ow and of course it didn't hurt but uh and it was not it was not abuse but he you know so i i have great fond memories of of certain ones but there's there's definitely teachers that are uninspired because they they get into it for the right reasons like everybody right Mm -hmm. and then they're teaching to a test they're they're they they just finally realize it's not for them right and then some in some situations it's like hey this student's just not getting it and then the administration administration at the school's like too bad pass them yeah and i think the pressure to know it all is not fair like oh no all to know all yeah and so so maybe you're growing the teacher base by enhancing their toolkit. And that's where data and AI and all of these other sources, you know, in the past, like Code Academy is a great, or Khan Academy, one of, mm-hmm. what, what, uh, they're, they're both really good out there. They're really good now. They're and, structured remote learning, but you still don't get the community though. But I'd, I would be happy if that was used in a classroom environment mm-hmm. and and then right. when there so, is a question you can get it answered you know because now we're to that point where i should be able to ask why can't i get this to work and it would not only show you where it's wrong but it will tell you why it's wrong and then that teacher over time will get good at that and instead of teacher why is this wrong and they'll be like i don't know um because it's really hard to look at code of for somebody else well you you're hitting on the elephant in the room as well because AI is a thing now, yeah. and domain-specific AI is something that you've been interested in. And what's to say yeah. that the best, you know, that best remote teacher isn't a domain-specific AI that then the the facilitator in the room uses to teach the class? Yeah. And maybe it's accompanied with some materials, if you will, you know, like uh, some videos and stuff. Yep. So I feel like the not only are we talking about these dilemmas, but it, it feels like you're working towards what that future model should look like. Yeah, I, I do believe the the future of artificial intelligence is a mixture of experts. It is mm-hmm. smaller, um, efficient, large uh, large language models models mm-hmm. um, that work together. Mm-hmm. And and so the idea is, what if you had an AI? teacher Mm -hmm. in all of these different disciplines that could talk to each other too, Mm -hmm. right? So if you're asking a physics question, that's really a math question, Mm -hmm. it it can bring that part in. And so this idea is it's it's not going to happen this year, but we are moving more towards that. The way I look at it is if I had a room of 50 individuals, Mm -hmm. would I want that room to have 49 dumb people and one really smart? Or would I rather have 50 pretty intelligent people mm-hmm. that all communicated very well together. Uh, that, that doesn't seem like it's a, like a decision that even takes a second to like, but wow. that's, that is literally what we're thinking when it comes to large language models. One large language model is not going to oh, solve okay, everybody's yeah. problem. But what if you had 50 that were domain specific mm-hmm. that there's going to be one engine. That's the, the, the logic that of how, them, yeah, yeah that, that, that does all of that. But then, um, because then what happens when there's a 51st discipline? Mm-hmm. I, do I have to retrain that model uh, that costs a half billion dollars? Yeah. Um, can I fine tune it? But then I'm fine, you know, so, or can I add it as another AI? Yeah. Well, I mean, and, it's a modular approach to AI. Yeah. And so, so that approach, now taking that to education, there is no reason why any student should not have 
almost like a digital twin mm. available to them at all times. So they have something to ask a question. The best thing you can do for education is instant feedback. Mm -hmm. And we now have the ability to have it and we're struggling with how to use that. Um, I, so, you know, GPT has uh, like a talk back feature. Mm -hmm. And so I've talked to it and it, and like used it as education on small uh, small subjects where I just like, it'll tell me something and then I'll ask, I just I ask all the questions I have. And then, uh, at the, I felt like each time I've done that at the end of the conversation, I feel like I know more and I'm, I'm only, I'm not asking it like uh, metaphysical concepts or anything like that or questions. I'm more like, how does this thing happen? Yeah. How does that thing happen? And, and it's filling me in on, uh, you know, the holes in my Swiss cheese. Yeah. All right, so we're at about 120-ish. Um, let's recap what a, what dilemma we have uh, talked about today. And, and obviously, education is a data problem right now. Um, yeah. It is. And, and so this is a data crisis in education. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an inflection point is what it really is. It, it was, whether it's a crisis or not, mm -hmm. we have done okay up to now, but the, the game is changing. Yeah. A new and better way to educate is coming. It has to. And so has everybody to. has to be open to the fact that, that that's going to happen. Because just, just in the state of Tennessee, we have to educate every single teacher in, from third grade up on uh, technology mm -hmm. and data. Mm -hmm. Because in the year 2028, every student that would have graduated at that point has had some sort of comp sci data science yeah. class in high school. And there, but right now, we don't have people to teach it because the people that can teach the coding, the computer science, and all that type of stuff, they just go get jobs where they make twice, two, three times as oh, much. Oh, of course. And as long as those jobs are out there, you're not going to get... You're not going to get a domain-specific teacher in the tech field yeah. consistently at every high school mm -hmm. in every state across the country. Yeah. Can so we have to, it, it is it is amazing how I keep saying this and I'm like we can't assume the old system will work for the new environment we're in. Mm -hmm. And and all you hear is how do we get more teachers? How do we get more teachers? I'm like I've been hearing it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get more new teachers in yeah. highly technical, highly sought after skills. Mm -hmm. um, but can we create facilitators? You know, that might be different. So we, we are starting to see this idea of, you know, what that could look like if there was a way to disseminate that information. Well, I haven't seen how you teach your classes. I feel like you play both roles effectively because you, you create the materials for your students to ingest on their own. Mm -hmm. And then when they yep. come to class, that's your instant feedback. I'm gonna spend, I'm not going to spend my time teaching you the concept. That's right. I'm going to be answering, or I mean, you are, but you're not, you're not explaining it to them point blank yeah. in the moment. You're not wasting that time, that interpersonal time, just going over stuff that they can learn online, that you're taking that time to use the, the individualized approach to educating that student and then yeah. that student over there and then just the class at large because you're you're communicating with them you're hearing what they have to say and that's what a facilitator could be more than mm -hmm. just somebody talking at a classroom yeah most teachers are caring and mm -hmm. you know you think about this uh, out of 10 people how many of them are good on camera maybe one okay i feel i'm that one like I'm good on, I, I, I do okay with video. I've been doing online classes since 2005. Mm -hmm. um, there's still many classes at my former university right now where people are hearing my voice. Mm -hmm. um, I can make videos that teach people. I've been doing it for a while. Yeah. Um, what about the other nine? Why are they creating the videos then? Right? I have, they have to. And, my, and they have to and they're told to. And so my son right now has a class where um, – he can't understand the professor. My, uh, my wife had that with one of her physics teachers. Yeah, and it's like he, they should be getting something from me or somebody else that can mm -hmm. communicate really well. And by the way, in the classroom, my son loves this guy. Mm -hmm. um, but – and he's caring and he'll spend extra time with him. But then he has to watch videos from him and he's like, I, I don't know what he's saying. And, yeah. and that's just not fair. He has a terrible mic. Why should he have to go buy these beautiful mics? Like, you know, he shouldn't, you know, it's not fair to the teacher to become 
a a videographer. Well, that that's but that's the same motif that we've been talking about. It's not fair to the teacher to require them to be everything all at once. That, that's a great point, especially yeah. when we're not going to pay them to be everything all at once. So that's part of the dilemma. Then, mm-hmm. so if we go back to the dilemma, um, the audience is still those that are educated through a traditional space, and it, yeah. whether it's K through twelve or K through uh, undergrad. It's, it's all of those components. I, I then think about that pain point. A lot of the pain point still comes to me. It's a misalignment uh, between a goal and the objective or the measurable objective. Well, you, you get on this all the time. It's like, I'll say what my goal is, and you're like, that's not a goal. That's not a goal. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's because it's not. Um, you, just, you just said it the same way you always say it. I do. That's not a goal. Yeah, and, and I got I to gotta get better at that because I, I keep making people you know defensive when I say things like that. But people will tell me all the time, uh, well, I, I've got some major examples on that we'll use for another uh, episode. Yeah. Um, but but I think that's a component of it. Now it, we understand there's definitely some resource limiters, mm-hmm. but there's also some major opportunities now with AI and yeah. other technologies. So there's opportunities that we see. We do see the resource limiters. We understand the pain points. What other? Uh, there's also pain points for the teacher. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm saying. So the teachers are required to know everything all at once. Administrators are trying to figure all this out. While in some cases, the, again, they're working against the student's best interest because they require the student to fit an antiquated model. And so that's, you know. And, and, and to add to the teacher part, mm-hmm. I bet you the teacher knows what that student needs to get educated, but they're told to do something different. Yeah. It's like, um, it's like, uh, we, we had a conversation earlier this week with a guy who did uh, quality control mm-hmm. at, a, at a manufacturer. And there's a, there's two different ways to think about it. Like the, the QC, you know, engineer people know best and yeah. the line worker doesn't know anything. And then the other, the other way is the line worker sees the machine and Very knows the machine. So. And so the person doing, pushing the pencil in the background doesn't know anything when the reality is it's a bit of both. It's a, it's a mixture of knowing the person working and doing the job, which is the teacher, and then the people administering the job, which is the admin staff. Like They have to get together in a way that, that doesn't seem like they work together right now. And, yeah. and in the situations where you and I have talked, it very much seems like they're at odds uh, because there, there's, like, uh, there, there's a lot of inter- there's a lot of politics in it that yeah. I wouldn't. And, and I you know, guess. it's it's almost like saying centralized versus decentralized. You know, kind of approaches, and so you get that in a lot of different environments. But um, yeah, I, 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 hundred percent. I, I feel sorry mostly for the teacher. Mm. Um, now I know a lot of teachers. Every one of them has an amazing heart, mm. but every one of them feels burned out. Mm. And and overwhelmed. I hate that. I and hate that the most important, some of the most important people in our society are treated like uh, second class employees. Well, think about this. I'm going to cut your pay uh, by uh, by um, uh, let's say sixty percent, mm-hmm. um, and by the and to get ready for the next day, you have to stay after mm-hmm. and write your plans to be ready for the next day. Oh, the, the thing that gets And me, by the way, you want anything? Go buy it yourself. That's the piece that gets me more than anything. It's like, hey, you want to decorate your room? Or no, no, not, hey, you want to decorate your room. You've got to decorate your room and get it ready for the, for the kids. But with no money. Yeah, go get your own materials. Yeah. Or you can solicit parents for materials and that's also on you. Well, that's always the case now. And think, yeah. you know, luckily there's a lot of uh, parents that are willing to help out. Yeah, but not, that's not always the case. That's how you get these schools that are like, parents make the difference in, a, in an elementary school and then in high school too, but elementary and middle schools, 100%. That's a good point. Like a, a parental participation gets the teachers so much further. So, so like my wife is always a room parent. And so she brings work home and we're literally like, sta- like, tearing pieces out of a math book and making a 10 page little thing that the kids are working on. It took me and her, it took she and I, uh, two hours to do that one thing. Mm. And if we didn't do it, the teacher had to do it. And yeah. if it took us two hours, it would have taken her four hours and she can't do that during school hours. Yeah. And then, then you add in all of the, 
parent uh, problems or that you add into All that. Time. And, oh and you know, uh, there's a reason I'm not a teacher. Yeah. Like a, a teacher in school. I'll, I'll tell you, professor's a lot easier than K through 12. Um, you know, because they're know, adults. You're not, you're they're not ad- convincing me about that. Well, the, <laughs> I've had issues lately. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, that That's okay. All right. Uh, I feel we... We, I have a lot better idea of the dilemma after this conversation yeah. than I did at the beginning. And so now, as far as the uh, the data mindset model goes, we're going to go find the data, yeah, and and see what the data says. We're, we don't have an like our outcome is to to maintain education in a way that fits in the mm-hmm. new uh, the new way of looking at things. But right now, we're in the the data discovery. We're, we're moving into data discovery. Now, data discovery can be more than just go find data. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be go find good use cases where they're doing it right. Mm. And that would probably be, you know, like Switzerland or, Swe- you know, well, there's other... You others. Would determine how good it is based off of the data coming from it. That's true. There has to be a metric yeah. that we have identified. I also think we need to... But, but because of the dilemma that we've identified... It's more than one metric. Mm-hmm. It's it you know yes, there's student met, uh, metrics that we can look at, but now what is what is what is the going rate for a teacher? You know what is so there's aspects are um, how many open positions are there? Well, there's there's going to be a lot of good information on that because it, just in the United States there have been several states that have uh, set minimum wages for teachers. Tennessee is surprisingly one of them. Wow, uh, but it, it's it's not what it should be. Yeah, uh, and I want to say it's either California. It's one of those West Coast states that I think they set a minimum teacher salary at seventy thousand. Wow, and I would imagine that they've got a, a few more people like uh, uh, ready yeah. to educate than we do here. I want to say that they set ours to forty five or fifty, which is it's a lot better than I would it, think it is. Just having a just having yeah. a floor like Tennessee it surprises me in some ways and doesn't in others because we're traditionally a. Uh, conservative state which means that we don't want to spend money on public programs yeah and so department of education is a public program that's why we've got this whole voucher mess that we've got going on right now sure not uh, but it uh, i lost my train of thought that, I, well, I, I got well, well, well we've been we've been upset. paying teachers but part of the way you, you can't just up everybody's um salary, right? Because that is a huge cost. But can you be more mindful of who are your teachers yeah. and, and make sure that you have teachers that are teachers and pay them yeah. and then then have facilitators? There could be different uh, rules there. Um, and then what is the best way to deliver content and knowledge? Mm-hmm. And what is the best way to create an education? Those, yeah. those, those are two complementary things, but not the same thing. Yeah. I think that if you're teaching a high school biology class, that the state, every, every single classroom in the state should have access to the best biology curricula and videos and all that That's type right. of stuff. And then the in-room facilitator goes off of that. Does the labs and everything and make sure you don't blow anything up. Right, right. Yeah. Now, if you want to, yeah, and that puts, that takes a lot of stress off of the the, the people in the room to to have all of that extra stuff too because they're, you know, right now they just have to do everything all at once and it's, yeah. just, it's just too much. So, uh, next one in the data crisis, we'll focus on data discovery mm-hmm. and then after the data discovery, we will focus on solutions mm-hmm. that are based on Charlie and Charlie It'll be our uh, personal opinions, not our professional ones, Mm -hmm. but it will be based on data Mm -hmm. and a dilemma, and we will do our best to do our due diligence in the data discovery uh, phase of that. Um, I think uh, think we've spent enough time on this dilemma. Mm Mm-hmm. I believe so. Uh, I, I really want to thank again the National Technology Council for this wonderful facility. And if you're interested in the course that I was talking about, it does start May 8th. And you can just go to technologycouncil.com to uh, get more information. And of course, we'll have it in the show notes. But uh, if you want to know more about us, we are dataforall.io. Mm-hmm. And you can get all of the information you need. And please subscribe on your favorite podcast and on YouTube for us. And uh, for the Data for All podcast, I'm Charlie Apigian. You didn't ask me if I was done yet. I know. Uh, but this time I'm not done. Okay. You forgot something. What did I forget? You forgot charlieapigian.com. 
Yes, I do have charlieapegan.com and I have a fancy picture of me up there. Yeah. Um, do you have the ability to sign up for consulting there? You you have the ability to connect with me directly. That's and that's and where that's where it starts right now, right? That is the funnel. Yes. So if you're if you're an executive out there and you're wanting to grow your vocabulary and understanding of data and how, as how it relates to business intelligence and AI, go to charlie uh, charlieapegan.com and uh, reach out to him. Thank you so much for that, Charlie. And thank you for this incredible conversation. Uh, it's meaningful. It's meaningful to talk about oh, we're getting, uh, data. We're, we're getting somewhere. And, and education. And so again, I'm Charlie Apigian. And I'm Charlie Yielding. And until next time. <laughs>